Never settle for less, you see the ghetto is blessed To put a mark on the US like Monica's dress Because the first shall be last and the last shall be first Brother, deal with the hurt and understand what you worth I was made to move the earth since the day of my birth So why glorify others lying under the dirt Too many lost on the curves, too many words never spoken Dreams never heard, too many teens die hoping And we owe it to ourselves, to organize ourselves From the brothers on the streets to the brothers locked themselves We gonna get, it, get started, just a little bit of snow ain't nothing out there um, but I had to go back downstairs and grab this sign because it's appropriate. It says, my name is Ricardo, by the way. It says, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Um, so I said that to say, we don't, we ain't got to have a standing room only to get this thing going. Just need a few of us committed, thoughtful, and serious, um, regardless of the weather. And so without further ado, the first thing I'd like to do is have Ananza come up here and to introduce, or, Tanya, also known as Noel, a member of Black. Hello, everybody. I'm Tanya Hello. Noel. How y'all doing? A um, member of Black. Um, so, Brother Youssef is going to be speaking. Youssef is just a profound author. Um, he has he has a movie. It's Detroit's Native Son. I met Youssef um, on our trip to Ferguson. He was just boots on the ground every day, and that's basically just his whole motto that's him all the time boots on the ground whether it's working with the homeless whether it's working with the youth um whether it's here he's on panels you can see him anywhere so that's that's it that's it so that's what you said how everybody feel good yeah. so i'm from detroit we say what up though yeah. so it's, it's, it's like every time I'm out here, man, if I do something that the either snow real bad or rain or something. But it's all it's all good, man. It's, it's an honor and pleasure to be here with you guys. Uh, so we're gonna talk about restoring the neighborhood to the hood, community work. How many of you have seen uh, Selma? Okay, so I'm, I'm kind of I'm, I'm not trying to critique the movie, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna use it as a as a um, as a basis for community work. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember the scene when when King's kind of coming in, in the church. And he's, he's talking to the SNCC workers, James Foreman and um, John Lewis. And he tells like, you guys have been doing some great work in the community. Now it's time to kind of leave that alone. And, and we go and do, make these deals and, and connections. But I think we need to rewind and understand like it's the work that SNCC did in fertilizing the ground that made it possible for them to, for King and them to come in and do the work that they done. But in the movie, again, emphasizing movie, it, 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 it dilutes that situation. If we don't have connection to the community and the work and the people there, how can we achieve anything? Our greatest achievement is building with the people. And building with the people is understanding the circumstances and the conditions that they're facing. So, so what SNCC did was to examine the community, examine the community and look at the social, political, and economic conditions that they was facing. Couldn't vote, they was being um, attacked for voting, et cetera, et cetera. And they, they developed a program around the immediate needs of that community. And those programs they developed built the confidence of that community, of that people, of that oppressed community. You know, even though I'm not from, from Rochester, New York, I'm from Detroit, and there's, there, and there's similarities in the same conditions poor education, poor teachers, poor misrepresentation. I mean, th these are universal problems, universal uh, social conditions, economic conditions that any of, any of us can, can, can find ourselves in. But what we need universal on our end is the work to be able to address those issues. So SNCC laid the groundwork where the where Black Panther Party became a extension of SNCC. So what, what I mean by that, when you look at the work they was doing in the South, it exposed the racism that many of us seen, the white supremacy and, and the brutality of it. But up north, up north, it, it was it was very hidden. 
It was in a way that, that we didn't see it. It was very subtle. But with the, with the party, the Black Panther Party, did the same thing. They organized around the social condition within their community and, and, and heightened the contradiction of addressing one of the most important needs, which was the, the brutality of the uh, racist police against black people in our community. But many of us think like, like Huey and, and Bobby Seale just one day, just let, let's go get some guns and run out and run out here. No, they started in school. Huey started from reading the law books. And, and reading the law books, he understood that was a law that he could challenge. So, so they organized around that. How many of y'all know that the, the Black Panther Party that Huey Newton and Bobby Seale founded wasn't the first Black Panther Party? It wasn't. The Black Panther Party, there was three other Black Panther Party before Huey and Bobby Seale founded theirs October 16, 1966. So what Bobby and Huey did, they called Stokely Carmichael snicking them down south. Why? Because they, because they developed that concept. When, when snicking them was organizing the Mississippi Freedom Dem Democratic Party, it was the Black Panther that they used as the logo and organizing within that community. I mean, you all know about the Deacons for Defense. Deacons, of, Deacons for Defense was organizing self-defense groups against racist tax in, in the south. So again, the south laid a foundation for the work that began to do up north. However, we don't also look at many, many of the, the folks that joined the Black Panther Party was like first generation up north. You know, 17, 18 years old. So they, was, they, they experienced racist south, but now coming up north, it was like, it's time to do something a little different. So again, they're, they're being educated by the social conditions, and, and, and we tend not to look at the conditions. If we're not responding to the conditions in an appropriate way, then how can we call ourselves organizers? Uh, as organizers, we basically should be social, social scientists, social doctors, looking at those conditions. When we're looking at the conditions, we're looking at, we're looking at the people. And when we look at the people, we have to look at ourselves. Why do we need to look at ourselves? Because we are the people. We are of the community. If we're trying to organize as we're not of the community, you, you've already failed. If you're organizing, if you're above the community, you're just like the folks that we, that we plan on fighting against. So some of us come with our high degrees, our, our higher education with our nose up in the air, and we wonder why nobody listens to it. Because you can have the best program, you can have all the money, but it don't mean jack if you ain't connected to the people. And so many of us are running from the problems because of we don't want to face in ourselves. So as organizers, as folks who are doing this work, we have to look at ourselves first and foremost in the mirror. I mean, particularly in the time that we're, we're at present in, you know, we look at constant uh, social abuse, physical abuse. Some of us have experienced it. Some of us have perpetuated in our community. We have, we have to begin to create space where we can heal within ourselves. Because as oppressed communities and oppressed people, we're damaged human beings. We're damaged in so many ways that it st has stagnated and stunted our growth. And stagnating and stunting our growth, it, it prevents us from being, from being able to communicate in a way of love. Love is the essential ingredient for organizing. If you don't have love for the people, why are you doing it? So, we, so when you see a Jesse Jackson who, who has been paid off, you see an Al Sharpton who's been paid off. I'm sorry if I, if I hurt anybody feelings who, who look up to those guys, but the facts are the facts. You know, when you don't have genuine love for the people, and again, when you have genuine love for the people, you have genuine love for yourself. There's no separating you from the people. Like for me, I mean, the neighborhood I come from and the work that I'm doing, I mean, to, to everybody outside, I'm, I'm Yusef Shakur, the author, blah, blah, blah. I don't mean a damn thing in my community because this is my community. This is, this is where folks have died on this corner. Whether you agree with how they died or whatnot, but th this is fertilized with my homies. This is fertilized with my grandmother and my mother and, my, and, and folks who I, I've grown up with. That means something. That meant something at one other time in our communities back south on the dirt roads and, and that would help shape us to be able to be who we are because poverty was never excused to be a poorly. Poverty was every reason to love each other even more. But what, but what happened? We thought we won. The game's still being played though. While, while they continue to score, we, we're in a maze of confusion. 
And confusion is the enemy of revolution. Confusion is the enemy of achieving what we want to. And as long as we have confusion, folks can come in and say and do whatever. They can come in and say, no way, I'm going to give you $20,000 $20, to support your, your garden. She jumps on me. Where is our principles? Where is our values? Because at one point in time in our, in our community, we would say all money ain't good money. We would say all money ain't good money. If that person in heaven came and broke bread with you, why, why are you taking money from that person? If that person has not came and, and, and really felt the fabric of this community, why, why are we accepting him or her in our community? And we know that they're a snake. Our values and our principles of our community is, is, is what's drawing that line. We don't have that anymore. It's open game. Because of the, the, the tide that's come in where, where folks have moved up the social ladder, the economic ladder, but, but in, in, in capitalist America, it, it does that. While, while we're devaluing who we are as human beings every day, and they're benefiting and exploiting that, where, where it pits us against each other. I mean, one of the greatest social crimes in the last 50 years has been the emergence of nonprofits in the black community. The emergence of nonprofits, the emergence of these foundations, we have created this rat situation where, where we all like rats and, and, they, and the money they're throwing out to us like cheese and we run out, we <laughs> fight and killing each other over it. And sure, you know, some, it may help this community, it may help that community, but what about the other communities? What about the other schools? I know back in Detroit, you know, you got, you got foundations where they created this good, skill, good school thing. So what about the rest of them? You saying the rest of the schools bad schools? I mean, I was taught as a little boy, but if you ain't got enough to give everybody, don't give none at all. That's, that's what grandma told me. Because why? Because it creates jealousy. It creates envy. It creates bitterness. I mean, and these are from the folks that are supposed to know. These are from the, the, the influent folks, but they don't care. Because we don't care. Because we may be poor in our pocket, we're rich in who we are. We may be poor in our pockets, but we're rich in who we are. And that becomes more stronger, or more, more beneficial, and has more value when we connect each other to, to that pot. I mean, because the reality, I mean, there's days I walk around, I got less than $5 in my pocket. But my name means something. My name means something to fuck. I can come to Ricardo and say, man, I ain't got it. Today. Here you go. Get it, get it back to me when you can. And it's, true, it's a true story. I'm just in, I'm just in uh, Baltimore. I had a, some of y'all somebody see my the, I post on, on, on Instagram. My shoe was coming to loose from all the work I do. And Eddie Conway bought me a pair of these brand new shoes I got on, $100. Why? Because he believed in the work that I do. He said, you need, you need boots. When my, car, when my car got stolen, people raised $1,500 for me in two days. Not for me, but because of the work. We, and we have to separate the personality from the person. Because it's about principle. It's not the personality that we want to follow. It's the principle that we want to be behind. And we're behind the principle, then we can have honest dialogue. Because if I fuck up, then well, you need to come and tell me. And not, not worship me. Not, we, 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 we have to learn from the past to understand the pitfalls that we've made. Because what happens is, well, Yusuf, he doing, he doing the backpack giveaway. Well, Yusuf, he helping the homeless. That's the great stuff he doing. It's Yusuf, Yusuf. Well, it should be us, us, us. Because it's not my job, it's our job. It's our job to better our community. It's our job to care. It's our job to invest. It's our job to enrich each other in this process. But we have to do it in, in a very strategic way. You know, we have to control our neighborhoods. Once we control our neighborhoods, we can begin to build our community. We can be, once we begin to build our community, we, we, we have a power base. That's why politicians come to your community. They, they want your power, which is you. We, and we have, we have, to, we have to put a, a barrier on that and begin to, to produce folks out of our community that's, that's going to represent us that, in that way. However, we need to create new programs, new, new platforms, new strategies. In, in the sense of we're going to run folks. And most, most politicians, if you're trying to run for office, depending on what office, they're going to tell you you need an extra amount of dollars. 
So, so let's, let's flip it. Let's say you need $100,000 to run for a city council. And we're going we're gonna to run a NASA for that position. And, and, and NASA gonna, we're not going to talk about the safe issues. We're not going to, we're going to talk about the real issues in our community. And the money that we raise, we're going to hire formerly incarcerated men and women to work in the community. We're going to hire the kids to clean up the neighborhood. We're going to use this as a platform to rally the community, to, to show them what true people power looks like. So even if NASA doesn't win, the community still won. Because the, because the, platform that she ran on was organized to build the, the a momentum to invest in the community, not to invest in an individual. However, if she do win, we know where she comes from. We, we, we ran on a true platform that represents the people. And also we are aware of that the system that she goes in doesn't have our best interests at heart. So she's going into a, to a devilish situation off the rip. However, whatever really shows that we possibly can get, she, we know we have someone at the table that represents us. I mean, this is the conversation that we have to have. These are the strategies that we have to have. You know, we need allies. And to have an allies, we need allies to understand the circumstances and the condition that we're talking about. We're talking about black people in the black, in the black, black community, black condition. We need white allies to understand that and respect that and support that and pushing black leadership. Not saying that you cannot be a leader within this, within this format, but supporting our leadership because too long white folks have led us. NAACP, the NAACP, even though it, it looked black, it looked black, it was white-led in the sense of, 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 of the money that, that was behind it, the, the decision makers. The NAACP killed the, the Niagara movement. The Niagara movement was founded before the NAACP, which was um, W. Du Bois, Ida B. Wells, a bunch of other folks. Well, sure. well, actually, we're not too far from from Niagara Falls. That was where it was named after. However, for some folks, and it was it only was in existence maybe two or three years because some folks in the Niagara movement felt the need to, to, to be inclusive to white people to be involved. Again, we're saying we we're saying you not to help us, but we're saying we don't need you to come in and lead us. But more important, we don't need white guilt. We don't need white missionaries. We need white radicals. We need white revolutionaries. We need joint individuals who are sitting at this table and understanding what this is. Um, I met Linda Evans one time. Linda Evans came out of the SDS, Student for a Democratic Society, the Weather Underground. She talked about Matulu Shakur. And she said Matulu Shakur had challenged them in the 70s to use their white privilege to service um, black liberation. Matulu Shakur had challenged them to use their white privilege to service black li the black liberation struggle. If you're really down, if you really care about black people, then you'll meet this command in, 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 a, in a way as comrades. And another comrade of hers is uh, Marilyn Buck, who was another member of SDS and Weather Underground. Marilyn Buck tells a story who, who was a very progressive person. And she actually went in, in a community in Chicago and took a picture of this, this, this mural. And some black children began to, to cuss at her and yell at her. And Marilyn Buck, she said she felt bad because, like, I'm here to assist and help. But she said she went home and she evaluated. She felt she felt just as the imperialist had felt. I mean, had done. She came and imposed herself in that community. She never came and knocked on their door and said, "Is it all right if I come in your community and take this picture?" I mean, those are two different dynamics there. Again, because it, it doesn't. You don't have to be a poverty to help somebody. You don't have to be a rape victim to help somebody who's been raped. But you damn sure gotta give a damn. You gotta you gotta be able to meet that person where they at and be able to lift them up from that position by getting on your knees or whatever you need to do. I mean, that, that's, that's true partnership. That's true relationship. That's cool, true, genuine comradeship that's, that's necessary to build, build this movement that, that's needed. But more importantly, in building, organizing, and building ourselves, we fundamentally have to ask ourselves, are you committed? Are you willing to commit yourself to the long hours, to the sleepless nights? to the payless jobs, to the, to the ridicule, all, the, all those things that come with this, this work. This is, this, is, this is not an easy job. I mean, because it's easy to quote Malcolm X, but you can't show up on time. I mean, if you know anything about Malcolm, Malcolm kept a watch. He, he, he was a very timely person. It's easy to quote a style of Shakur, but you can't complete a, 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 a task. I mean, you, these, these are the contradictions that we're living with. 
or quote a style that you ain't even read her book. I mean, these, these are, again, the contradiction that we're living, we're currently living with, living in. You know what I mean? For me, when I, when I travel, these, I travel with these right here. These are my books. It's personal. I mean, I, I, I don't, they, they say when you, you don't leave home without your wallet, these, these, these are my wallet. And these are my God, these are my maps. And because I understand, this is, it's on their shoulders that I stand on. It's on their shoulders that we stand on. This is the, the work that we're doing. It's nothing new. Michael Brown murder is not a new murder. A new social phenomenon, Trayvon Martin, et cetera, et cetera. But it, again, but when, you, when you're trapped in this small uh, capsule, you don't, you're only looking at it from your hood or, or from your block. You're not looking at it from a global standpoint. And that's why it's so important to travel. That's why it's so important to connect uh, with other neighborhoods, with other, with other cities. And you, you begin to see, like, this is just the same thing that's happening all over the place. This is not just a, a Rochester problem. This is a national problem. And we begin to understand what must be done. You know, many of us talk about, like, police brutality. And if we, if we eliminate police brutality, that's going to solve the situation. That's not. If we, don't, if we don't eliminate black oppression, if we don't eliminate white supremacy, if we don't eliminate capitalism and imperialism, because po co police work to protect those things. Even, even when folks don't even realize that's what they're working to protect. Because within that system, they've been conditioned and designed to work to and protect. Same with mass incarceration. You know, folks, it's, it's a big campaign. You know, Michelle Alexander ushered that in with her book, the, the New Jim Crow. I think it's a phenomenal book. However, we can't continue to have uh, half, an, half an analysis. What I mean by half analysis is birth, mass incarceration didn't give birth to black oppression. Black oppression gave birth to mass incarceration. Again, when you, start, when you go back and study history, 13th Amendment, neither slavery nor voluntary servitude shall exist except as a punishment for a crime. So the same amendment that supposed to abolish slavery legalized it. And then again, when you look at the social conditions and the economic conditions of our ancestors that was prisoners of war that was reduced to be slaves, when this amendment came with the Emancipation Proclamation, it was pushed off these plantations with no education according to America. So what else do you think I'm going to do? Of course I'm a rob, steal, whatever. I mean, because at the end of the day, first law of nature is self-preservation. This gave birth to the to the chain gangs. This gave birth to the prison a pop, a prison population as we see now. This was a tr uh, sophisticated way to move oppression in a different way that it, we, we didn't see it. So you fast forward, it's the same circumstances. You see all the young brothers out there, they barely can, can, can speak one sentence that you probably can, you can comprehend. So when you talk about legal jo or jobs, the only job they qualify for is robbing. The only job they qualify for is selling dope. Not saying they can't do anything other than that if, 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 we, if we don't do our job in reaching them, but I'm saying that they've been conditioned. They've been conditioned that way. Because when heroin came in our, in our community, and again, when I say came in, it was intentionally brought into our community, it put us to sleep. And if anybody's seen some folks who've done heroin, and so when, when heroin put us to sleep, crack cocaine came in and knocked us out. Community just went cake buck wild. Because that put us to sleep and crack woke us up in a way that folks was behaving, you know, women selling their babies. You know, guys just you know, stealing from their mamas. I mean, just doing crazy stuff. But this is chemical warfare. Chemical warfare, part of a larger plan. I mean, so we're being attacked on so many levels that it has us scattered. And we have to organize on every level. And organize on every level, we have to be assessing what's going on, and we have to be a part of the, part of the community and part of the people. And, and being part of the people, we have to win their hearts and minds. And we have to do that through being uh, practical, having sternness, and having integrity. Integrity is the, is the not, a number one thing. Again, we, we, we may disagree, um, ideology, religion, philosophy, all those things, that's, that's natural. But, but when it comes to integrity, when it comes to principle, we just, 
Now we get to disagreeing on that, that's a different situation. Because there's a lot of folks I don't like. I mean, that's just, that's just natural. However, integrity-wise and principle-wise, I still can respect you. I still can work with you. Hope you can still work with me. Because we're all, I mean, we can't operate from, from the basis of our feelings. Many of us know our feelings will lead you in a way that you, <laughs> a place you don't want to be. But by being guided by our principles, we're making sound judgment. Especially when you're working for the people, it's, it's, it's not about being a leader, it's about being a servant. Because everybody wants to be in this, this title of a leader. And, and, and for the most part, we're all leaders. You should be, for the most part, which is fundamentally leading yourself. But, but when you're in a position of, or, or trying to be in a position of leading other po folks, that's, that's, another, that's another situation. Because the fundamental we're trying to lead other folks is about being responsible. Are you responsible enough to make the best decision? Not for yourself, but for the folks that you're leading. Are you, are you willing to eat last? Are you willing to come out your own pocket for them? I mean, that's, that's what leadership is. You know, you know, Marcus Garvey said it's blood, it's sweat, it's pain, it's tears. Are you, I mean, Malcolm knew that he would be assassinated. He still went out there and faced those bullets. King knew that he would be assassinated. But was more, more beautiful than anything that they was fighting for future generations. What generation are we fighting for? What neighborhood are we fighting to, to sustain right now? And we have to begin to, where, where are we marking our territory? We can't just be all over the place. Because right now, that's where we at anyway. We have to begin to, to, to root ourselves somewhere. And it's kind of like, you know, when you, when you make that, that, that yearly uh, resolution, I'm going to lose 20, 30 pounds or whatnot, and you get to working out, and you, is it gone yet? <laughs> and you can't see it. That's how it is when you're working with people. You don't know who, who's watching you. Who's being impacted by it? But you gotta stay the course. You gotta stay consistent. You have to stay the course. You have to stay consistent. Cause when you give up, they definitely give up. They have no reason to not believe. Cause many of us, that's all we've been grown, we've grown up in is crack addicted households. Gang banging families. So to finally see something different, it's scary. I remember when, um, when, I, when, I, when I went to uh, training school and I came home and the, and the teacher asked me about going to college. And I was like, sure, I want to go to college. But when I went home that night and I thought about it, it scared the hell out of me. Because here I was at the age of 17, I didn't know what college was. Even though I had walked past Wayne State University and Mary Girl College universities in, inside of Detroit, but no one ever sat down and said, this is what this college is. This is how you can apply yourself to go on to do whatever you want to do. That thought frightened me to the, to the point where I tried to kill myself. Why? Because I was caught up in the suspense of undevelopedness. And there's many folks in our community who are, who are in that same circumstances, who are committing social su suicide in some form or some fashion. I mean, it, it takes genuine love and it, and it takes uh, uh, genuine courage to be able to, to recognize your oppression and recognize your oppression allows you to, to get on the path of liberation. See, many of us want to go out and change the world before we change ourselves. Many of us want to get out and change the world before we change ourselves. You can't, it's impossible. It's, 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 it's impossible because what you've done now is, I mean, I mean it's kind of like that bird. I mean, I mean folks in here took a bird bath. You now, you really want to take a shower and you needed to take a shower. <laughs> But you didn't have the time. So you go in and you just get the water. And you, so what you do is you're creating a worse situation. A worse odor. You can put a little deodorant on top of uh, covering up this little funk. And somebody, damn, what that, what, that, what that smell is there? That's a new smell. And that's what happens when you don't change yourself. You're setting yourself up for failure. It's like, it's like that, that sand castle. It's, it's beautiful. But when that strong wind comes, it knocks it down. And that's what happened to me when I was in a training school. Even though I, I changed some things, but I had not, I had not really dug deep and, 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 and put 
put away that anger that, that I had, that pain, the things that come with being oppressed. Because what happens is we internalize our oppression. And then we use drugs as a coping mechanism. We use gangbagging as a coping mechanism. We use the, 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 the ability to be ignorant as a coping me mechanism. Because it's easy to be those things than actually be a man, to actually be a woman. Because in, in reality, we haven't really seen those things. And so when, so when we look in the, in the, largest, the largest spectrum of drug abuse, prison, uh, white supremacy, all these things, that we tend to think are black problems, these are human problems. Because when you look at the larger scale of racism and white supremacy, it's creating the same social chaos in white neighborhoods and white communities. Now, the only difference is the media doesn't talk about it like it talk about it in the black community. And we have to understand why it doesn't. Because when you look at the sheer numbers, white people in America is outnumbered black people. So there's more white people that's on Welfare. It's more white people that's on drugs. By, by sheer number alone. However, again, understanding the, the dynamics there, black people only make up between 12 and 14 percent of the population. So when you talk about black on black crime, that's looking at it from that lens. That's what makes it so significant because how, 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 how small our population is here in this country. When you look at the prison population where we make over 50% but only 12% of the, of the general population. So that's what makes those numbers so alarming. But the media that, that's really telling us this, is this, they don't care. They're bombarding with us and, and, and programming this in our minds. They're programming of, of gangsters and thugs. You know, I was watching Mar Marshall Lynch this morning, early day, I mean, how, how many of y'all been following it? where the last couple of days he wouldn't say anything. I won't, I'm only here because I won't get fined. And he said today, all, all you guys are here to put a, me, a microphone on my face, but how many will, will, will come in my neighborhood and talk to me then and tell a real story in my community? I mean, whether you agree with his, his position, that was, that's true. He's speaking truth to power. Here's a black man in a dominant white sport. Come, more like he comes from a black ghetto, a black, a poor black community in which we know what that looks like. And here's the media never tells the true story of that community. And here, him using his position, using his platform to bring awareness to that. I salute him. I, I, I salute that more than, than, than LeBron James coming out with the I, I Can't Breathe shirt. I mean, because you really wanted to make a difference you really cared about my, um, Eric Gardner, don't play basketball. <laughs> that'll, that'll make a bigger statement than coming out there, I can't breathe. But again, how many of us are willing to make that sacrifice? How many of us are bold enough to do something like that? You know, you know how many black boys would, would, would really, the, the profound impact that it would have on them? If the uh, if Miami Heat, when, when they all came out in the hoodies, came in the hoodie and said, no, we're not playing basketball today. You know what I mean? When, when, when the um, guy owned the Clippers, they, they, instead, of, instead of having they, the Clippers shirt turned inside back, no, we're not playing basketball today. You know, because all he got was a, a raise, the guy who owned the Clippers. What, sold it for four, $2 billion? For saying nigger? <laughs> wow. And, and, and again, and that's, what's, that's why it's so important to be critical thinkers. I mean, anybody who knows the majority of the, the white men who own these basketball teams is not predominantly where they're generating their money from. This is a, that's a recreation thing for them. That, that is a recreation opportunity for, for white men to just kind of like gamble and just kick the breeze and, and got all these black, black guys playing and, you know, I can make me a couple million and just chill. My real money's over here. My real money's over there. But no one's questioning that. No one's putting a critical analysis like that because we're, com we're comfortable in being Americans. Well, America is not comfortable with us in the, in the way of being who we are. So again, it's, it's, it's important that we dig deeper. We, we think deeper. We question everything. But only, we only can do that if we're reading. Again, we can be poor, but we can be rich in our ideas. See, Malcolm wasn't a threat necessarily what he was saying. It was the ideas 
that he was generating in the minds of people. He was waking folks up. He was waking folks up. Same Ella Baker, Fannie Lou Hamer. It's, I mean, the names go on and on. And they're not afraid of them per se, but they're afraid of us because because they represent us. When, when, when one of us wake up, the potential is for all of us to wake up. Because none of us free until all of us is free. And these and these are the things that we have to look deeper and understand. Because once you stop looking at this world and stop imagining what it will be without a Martin Luther King, without a Fer Frederick Douglass, without a Harriet Tubman, then we're doomed. Because so, the so-called gangs that we have is a result of them. So the question is, who are, who are the next period of time? Who are the next Malcolm X? Not in the sense of who they are, but in the sense of who we are. Because the same condition that gave birth to them, it still exists today. That's why we should salute and uphold the Ferguson organizer. But we can't, we can't recreate Ferguson. We can't re recreate uh, the Trayvon Martin energy. We, ha we have to create things uniquely specific to our community, to our conditions. We can learn from them, we can, we can support them, but we also have to generate right here. Because this is a struggle going on right in this city. Struggle going right on in Detroit and, and et cetera, et cetera. And we have to connect these. We have to tie them all together. And doing that, we have to emerge new youthful leadership. We, we have to get rid of this old guard. This old guard is in the way. This old guard is the problem. Because they on the payroll, many of them. Or they just, they just burnt out. And then and some of them are elders. And, and those, we need to just go sit them to the side and, and, and get counsel from them. And get counsel from them. And learn from them. And get that wisdom that helps us, guide us, achieve what we need to achieve. So, so fundamentally, as organizers, we have to build a base within our community. We have to have a programs that are addressing food, shelter. Fundamentally, addressing the needs and building the, the hope. If there's no hope, there's desperation. And there's a thin line between the two. And we have to begin to build that hope. And that, and that's and, and doing that, people respect you. And respecting you, they begin to respect themselves. Because they see in you, they see themselves. They see a reflection of what they can be. And that and that's power. That is the power that we have to honor. That is the social phenomenon that we have to begin to create within our community. Because real power is making phenomena that, act in a certain manner, as Huey P. Newton taught, taught us. People learn through participation and observation. People learn through being, being involved. But being involved, you have to be consistent. Because they're used to folks coming in in a day, next week and a week after that, then don't see them no more. Or, or they're used to folks coming in, you, you need, you, Mary, you need some clothes? Okay, I need you to sign this first. <laughs> I need you to sign this first. And they get hit to that guy. Because they know after you get these signatures, they're going to turn it in somewhere to try to get a cash, cash refund off these signatures. So they so they hit the, you pimping me. And so and folks are getting tired of getting pimped. They just don't know how to, how to organize. So as organizers, we have to or, organize the unorganized. We have to educate the uneducated. And the most important thing, we have to help people see their self-worth. Once we awaken their self-worth, we will get changed. Any questions? Comments? Yes. My name's Lori. Yes. I um I believe that all of this change, if it doesn't change if we don't change the system of education, we're not gonna change the system, period. Because the language of education is written in the elite's language. And if we work to change the language of education so that we concentrate on the gifts and talents of our children, we will move towards achieving what you're talking about right there. But if we ignore how we educate our children, how we miseducate our children, then we just continue to support the elitist control. Absolutely. And I'll, and I'll just add on that particularly to, to black folks and the black struggle when you had um, you know, black first generation of black folks coming out of slavery that couldn't read or write. However, they, they ended up giving birth to children to go on to, to graduate from high school, graduate on education. 
So they didn't have a formal education, but they had a moral education. They had moral expectations. Same thing in the white community, et cetera. And this is where fundamentally we have to get back to. You know, like every, everybody in this room, we all go to Harvard, Howard, et cetera, et cetera. But we, none of us come back to our community. What happens? If this is our neighborhood, and we all get an education from one of these pre-strategic institutions, but, not, but none of us come back, how does that impact our neighborhood? Good or bad? And this is what's happening. Many of us, are, whether we're in education or getting money, we're abandoning the community. And those folks who, 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 who are bathing in that, that miseducation that, that you're talking about are, are, are stuck in those situations. So why wouldn't you think that would get worse? But again, it's a design plot. How do you think you go about um, like getting those institutions that are already in the your community? Like, like the Black Church is historically like a part of the movement, but like in Rochester, it's a Black Church everywhere in the areas that's you know going through it, but they're not generally like out on the front line. So instead of taking like maybe money from like these nonprofits and stuff like that, shouldn't the money be coming from like? the church or where where your grandmother is literally giving money. Right. So I mean, <laughs> we you know, we have to and uh, analyze why it's, it's like that. And, and that's not just a Rochester. That's a Detroit problem. That's a, in ur many urban city problems. But again, for the pastors that are, that are, have been are in the position of leadership through the church now is a different set of pastors than the ones you talked about. You know, their, their, their fingers are not on the pulse of the community in that same way. You know, most pastors, you won't see them now, you got to make an appointment. And, and you might not see them until next month. Versus in the past, you had access to, to, to talk with those guys. And, and I think fundamentally, it's, it's about getting, we know what that is this. So, so we, we just got to do the work in the community. Because if we win the people over, you're going to win that person over. Because that pastor going to go where the people are. That, the power is in the people. You just you just said it. I mean, the, your grandmother, my grandmother, you know, they're giving money to to these congregations. So being able to change that dynamic by changing that dynamic, we have to create programs and creating program winning people over one at a time. So and, and we can't come in, you know, like I'm I'm not a Muslim or a Christian, so I can't come in and say you can't stop praying that white Jesus. Hmm. I mean, all they're gonna do is create a confrontation. Who gonna hear this and that? Even though I, even though I may feel that's true, however, you got to meet people where they are. And, and meeting people where that is feeding them. Meeting people where that is clothing. Because if, if you can clothe them and they pastor can't, what, what does that say? If you can clothe them and feed them and they city council ain't, what does that say? That's heightening contradiction. As well as heightening contradiction, you're heightening their awareness. But also, we have, in heightening awareness, we have to create social vehicles for them to get involved in. Because now, there's it, it, nothing worse than feel ashamed. Like, I've been bamboozing the food for 30 years. And now I got to come outside and say, Ricardo, I've been hanging with him, and he didn't trick me all these times. But it's also part of my fault too. It's part of my fault for listening to the crap Ricardo was selling me. But I was just too busy to to buying into it because I didn't want to again clean up myself. So it was easy to run behind Ricardo because everybody see Ricardo, they don't see they don't see you, sir. So 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 do Ricardo. I'm able to hit, have my own pain, even though I'm sacrificing or through my own money. So we have to break that by heightening those contradictions and meeting people where they are. And those, those individuals are going to exist. But again, we have to create a standard in our community like those folks cannot exist in our community without serving the people. Because again, if all of, if you go and knock on my door as a pastor, it's easy for me to close, shut the door. But if all you guys in here come, <coughs> it's, it's, oh shit, I got to go. What y'all talking about? <laughs> Give me a minute, let me put my clothes on. <laughs> And talk to you guys, because it's a hundred folks at my door now. I, I have to pay attention, even though I, when, even when I don't want to. Any other questions or comments? Let me say something there. I just want to say that, that those that don't know, because he ain't going to tell you, he's done a lot of work in our community. And forget about Detroit, right here. He's been places where I can't go. He's been to the jails here. They're not letting me in there yet. One day I'm going back in there, but right now, 
um, and I'm going in there without no cuffs. Uh, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But because he's not from here, he's been allowed to go into jails, he's been into youth centers, in the schools, been here a few times, been to my house a bunch of times. Um, and he's been putting the work in. Um, he's putting the work in in Detroit, other places in the country. He's been organizing. He's written a couple books. He's been through some things. Um, been through a whole lot. This ain't been in the gangs. Um, he's got documentaries out. He's had a bookstore at one time. Um, who goes, who starts a bookstore? Who wants to open up that kind of business? He tried to do something different, you know? Um, and I just think it's important that people really understand um, who he is, because he's the humble man. He ain't gonna say nothing. I met him in Detroit about six or seven years ago. Um, they had a, a workshop at the social forum and they had a workshop and we didn't agree. We wasn't agreeing in there. But that's okay. I seen it, you know, I went out, he had these shirts called Restoring the word neighbor back to the word hood. So it becomes neighborhood. And it was kind of catchy. So I bought one and was hesitating and I looked in my pocket said, uh, how much you gonna charge me for another one for my wife? He ended up giving me about five or six of them shirts. I said, oh, this brother might be all right. I met him again in New York. Same, he was the same person. He was at the forum down there. And from there, this, it blew up. We became bonded, he's like a brother to me. And sometimes it takes somebody, um, outside of your surroundings to see things um, because you're so much of a part of it you can't see you know um, and that's what he's done and we're going to give him a breather to um, acknowledge what he's seen that I'm so much of a part of I haven't I've noticed it but a lot of us don't see it because we're here and we're a part of it and with that, we're gonna go to that chapter. Yeah, uh, the brother, as uh, one of the reasons for his stop here today, man, from outside of this community and inside, he's, um, cause he was here before the group Black was formed. He was coming here, he was coming here for the past few years. And Black was formed in August when the Michael Brown incident went down. And he was able to recognize how much of an impact this young organization has had on, um, not only on, on me, but my wife in this community. Um, and he came to make, um, to let us who sometimes don't see the forest for the trees, let us know that he see it. He respected and he appreciated. And without further ado, so, uh, so uh, any, any membership from Black here? You guys come up, huh? We call it. Yeah. So he came back and he wanted to give Black an award for the work that they've done. Yes, and it says it's the Neighborhood Warrior Award. It's your name! Oh, man! So actually, this is this is war for, for Ricardo. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! Hey, buddy. <laughs> 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 so that's that's the only way I, I felt I could trick him. It was, it was hard because he actually went with me to get this. Uh, <laughs> uh, we put it off. And one of the reasons I, I wanted to do this because Ricardo, you know, we travel the country and here and there, he's always like, you self, man, he do this and he do that. And, but Ricardo's my hero. Uh, he's not the guy. He 
he's not he's not gonna woo you with a bunch of pretty words. He, he doesn't have three three letters behind his name, but he got skin in the game. He has skin in the game. Uh, his experience is is I, I would take it or match it against Cornell West. Any any of those individuals, he got boots on the ground. Uh, I mean, it's it's those folks in our community that that's come out of this rough area that allows us to see the beauty of who we are. And I've seen it. I've seen his impact and his wisdom, his, his subtle way of just saying what it is that, that has helped create uh, positive change, not in just Rochester, but also in, in, in St. Louis and Ferguson. So my brother, it's, it's, it's a great honor to get it to you along with who we are. Alright! Alright! Yeah! Big feels, man. Yeah. Thank you, man. Boy, you bamboozled me. Yeah! Okay. Yeah, I, I really uh, appreciate this Bills jersey because I really love them. I really, really do. Some of us have weaknesses. This is my um, Wow. You, oh man. You know, I actually told people on the down low that we going to get an award to black. Uh, wow. Wow. I don't even know what to say, man. Uh, love you, my brother. I love everybody that's here. Um, I love this community, man, because the, the community accepted me and allowed me um, to come back and give back. You know, the past 10 years in my life, man, um, it have been just, just been perfect for, for me. You know, I've been able to be a positive role model. I don't care how bad I was. I never hurt anybody but myself anyway. But now I really feel that I have been giving back I have been, I know I've been giving back. Uh, and I feel the love from a lot of people in the community. It makes me a better husband, makes me a better father, makes me a better brother. You know, um, I still have some stuff to work on. I'm still like Martin Luther King. I still have a dream, I have a dream that one day, um, I can just be, just be free. Um, free to not worry about what somebody think. I'm not free like that now. I have to worry about what somebody thinks. If I get pulled over for a traffic stop, I have to make sure this man don't think I'm reaching for nothing. You know, I go into the, on the road, I stop at a, a store and I'm going in at nighttime. I'm pulling out my wallet before I get in there and I'm playing with my money to relax them because I have to worry about what they think. I need to let them know I ain't coming in here to spend nothing, to, to rob nothing. I'm pulling out my money before I even decided what I'm going to get because I have to worry about what people think. It's just the way it is. And if I could just walk around and not have to worry, that would be true freedom. Um, and there's nothing unique about um, that because it's just, unfortunately, it is a black and white thing. Blacks have to go through this on a day, daily basis. You know, um, I always tell a story about when I took my wife back down to them suburbs, to the rural community where she lived in Allegheny and she was pregnant so I had to stop the car to smoke. We weren't smoking in the car. I wasn't smoking in the car and I'm smoking. I got a do-rag on my head and I see the state trooper car coming. I First thing I did is hurried up and snatched the do-rag off because I'm worried about what this state trooper was thinking. I said, I'd rather for him to know that I'm a black man than to think I was a Muslim because back then, they really was, they was um, profiling the Muslim brothers worse than, if you had a kufi on, 
you you subject to be shot dead for real. You know, so I had like the double whammy. I'm black and I got the coupe on. Uh, you know, I just couldn't stand up that day. I had to say I got to reduce the odds of me getting shot, and that's what I did. So this that's the freedom. That's the dream I have of one day um, being not have to go through all this chains around my brain, man. I should be able to walk. Just walk around and don't have to be so cautious on all ends, you know? That's what I wish, man. And I'm, one other dream that I had is that all the schools would be, it wouldn't matter what school my kids went to. All the schools would have everything that my kids need instead of me having to pick a school, you know? Um, those are my dreams. And I just want to thank you again, my brother. I ain't had no speech prepared for this, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Love you guys. <laughs> let's, get back to the, let's get back to restoring the neighbor back to the hood. So I just have one more thing. I'm gonna I'll read the restoring the neighbor back to the hood 10 point platform, which it says, number one, we will work to develop our families and ourselves to the greatest extent possible by being a shining example of manhood and womanhood in our neighborhood. We will learn all that we can in, to improve the quality of our neighborhood. Three, we will work diligently to honor our family and our neighborhood with good deeds and treat our neighbors as our extended family. Four, we will keep ourselves mentally sound, spiritually grounded, physically fit, building a strong body, mind, and spirit that exemplify positivity and productivity in our neighborhood. Five, we will unselfishly share our time, knowledge, resource, and wisdom with our neighbors, young and old, in order to build and maintain a healthy neighborhood. Six, we will do our part to make sure our neighborhoods are clean and safe and that all people have access to healthy food, clothes, and shelter. Seven, we will discipline ourselves to, to direct our energies thoughtfully and constructively to reduce c conflict in our neighborhood by maintaining hope, harmony, love, and self-determination. Eight, we will train ourselves to never hurt or allow anyone to harm someone in our neighborhood for an unjust cause or through negative behaviors of stealing, gun violence, verbal abuse, police brutality, selling drugs, rape, or any other social ills that work to destroy our neighborhood. Nine, we will com commit ourselves to er eradicate all forms of oppression and exploitation, whether they be politically, educationally, socially, economically, uh, environmental, sexual, cultural, to prevent the... the, the uh, Erosion of the social fabric of our neighborhoods. Ten, we would dedicate ourselves to having boots on the ground to do the work to keep our neighborhoods a peace zone instead of a war zone. Yeah. Hmm? Uh, I can get you a copy on it. Uh, it should be on my, it's on my website. I look up to you, brother. I look up to you. Um, I do a program here at the Phyllis Wheatley Library called Read to Record. And um, I have kids read and write to record for free in the recording studio. They read a book for 30 minutes, write a paragraph from what they learn, and they can record one track for free in the studio. Um, I was working at an I'm Ready program where, you know, the kids go in and get long-term suspension from regular school, you know, and um, I was breaking up fights every day, you know, so I just had them come to the studio I let them record for free, you know, just when I started it. And um, I just, you know, let them record an hour. They read a book for an hour. Um, but I'm doing, um, communicating with a comrade in Detroit. Um, she's a part of the, the, um, the rider movement. Um, me and my cousin are the black rider movement. And she um, actually wants to help me start a reading record program there. You know, so I needed your help with that to try to bridge you know, that program, you get it. If you know anybody that does music there, but at the same time, you know, they have skills in music and have skills with just, you know, reaching the, the youth to um, run a program there. Okay. You know well, what I'm saying? We like that. I think the brother, the point he made is, too many of us get caught up in like, what's your program? Like, that's first thing, somebody interviewed me, they put a microphone, like, what, what's program you got? Like he said, shit, my program breaking up a fight. <laughs> <laughs> my program break, stopping that lady from stabbing her boyfriend. Not only him getting cut, but her going to penitentiary. I mean, these are these are basic things that we can do and we need to do, and we have to get caught up. Stop getting caught up in this non-profit way of thinking. Like you got to sit down and write this out. And I'm not saying don't write anything out or develop those type of programs, but having your finger on the pulse and being willing to assist someone. 
But first, you got to build a relationship. I mean, one time when we had the bookstore, Ricardo talked about a young, a young guy came in. He's like, man, I ain't ate in two days. I'm, um, I'm hungry. I could see it in his eyes. I knew, I knew, I knew, I knew the cold language. <laughs> and the cold language, if I don't get nothing to eat right now, I'll probably go rob somebody or fuck somebody up. I mean, this is what he's saying in so many words. I just went to the register and gave him $10. There wasn't, no, there wasn't no need for no speech or anything. Just let me immediately dress the, that need at that moment. But the, what's, what's missing was the fact that a relationship has been built where he took the time. I didn't drag him in. He took the time to come in the store and ask for it. Because he could have just right by, bypassed me and waited on him to come out the store and seeing him having $100 just knock him upside his head. So, so again, people are watching us. And as they're watching us, they're, they're building relationships. Again, we're not going to reach everybody in that moment. However, we can reach those who we need to reach. And I'm going to just leave you guys with this. In the sense of even ourselves being reached. Where I was, I was going through a rough moment. One day I had the baseball bat, was about to go do some things. In the community, it was this lady stopping like, come here, boy. I was like, what you mean, come here? And I had the bat behind my, like, I just love your book. It just did something to me. And that's what I needed here at that moment. I forgot about that mission I was going to, going to do. Again, so, you, so we don't know who we're impacting, that when it will come back and impact us. And that's, that's how God works. That's how God is using other people and using us to be vehicles to convey his message. Because if, if you're only waiting on Sunday to do God's work, that's a disgrace to God. You know, God working every day. You know, this church and spirituality is happening every day. And we have to be in tune with that if we want to make the differences and impact the, the people the, the way we want to. And I'm not saying go out and be no fools either. Don't be no fool in this work. Don't allow yourself to be pimped or exploited. But, but care and know how to do it. But again, if you're with the people, like when um, guys that was doing, we call, had 10 City in Detroit, where folks were still living out there. And I, and I saw the man and the woman, they was arguing about who was gonna go take this guy this money. I knew what they was talking about. They was, like, was going to buy some dope. Because nobody argued about who gonna go see Ricardo if you gonna, unless you don't know Ricardo. But I didn't condemn them. My, my concern was there to build a relationship with them. There was a need there. We got to stop judging people. We got to stop judging people because, because again, we all, we all have, have got baggage that we need to deal with. And once we can begin to recognize the humanity of other folks, we recognize our own humanity, and we can build a better community and build better people. So, you know, any other questions? That should be it. Well, oh, one more question. Well, it's not a question so much as okay. piggyback off of what you said. The, the language of the elite keeps us fighting amongst each other because of the differences we see in one another. And if we just transcend beyond the physical and connect with each other on a spiritual level, then those differences go away and we can progress as a, as a human species. And I would like to say, and this is sincere, that you since you spent this evening with me for this surprise uh, I would like to invite you back on March 21st up and downstairs the whole building no matter where you go you ain't even got to come up the stairs you can just go downstairs I'm having my 60th birthday party up here and, and if you don't do Facebook You've been formally invited, and I mean that. Don't say what well, he ain't really mean that. I really mean that. I can't think of nobody else I would want to be around, but the people that's out here on the ground with me. So I really hope that you um, would show up because we got the upstairs and down. Um, no gifts. If you want to be in the D 3D club, that's fine. That's the a drink, a dessert, or a dish. And that you don't have to do that. Um, that's it. March 21st. Right here is the place. Um, we going to share, break bread together. I'm going to shake it up. I may even sing. <laughs> and I'm going to get my wife to dance. <laughs> yeah, so seriously. 
not only you know because it's important um because this work is so it's like beyond a marathon you know um some some ripples of it won't even be seen until probably after we all gone um so we need to have some fun sometimes um we need to you know that's how the bond is it gets built being able to laugh together um and i figure if you get a few of them whatever you're drinking be it chocolate milk budweiser or whatever we're gonna have it here get our laugh on man because it do a lot for me. Just like I get a lot from the love I get in the community, there ain't nothing like a laugh. Amen. Ain't nothing like a laugh. And with that, I ain't through running off my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> um, how do you feel like, to understand the best way to like interact um, people would be like feeding and clothes and things like that, but how do you, like involve people who are because you get this class structure within like the black community where once you like rise above needing things you don't kind of feel as involved in the community or once you get like a degree or something like that then you you definitely don't feel like you're in that same place it's like once you get to the middle class or not even to the middle class it's almost there you don't feel as involved as the people at the bottom so how do you reach those people who aren't don't have a need yeah. Does everybody have a need? I mean, you know, I mean, you talk about the black experience, which we all love. We, we how much we, we may think that we, we are avoiding or won't get pulled over by police and reminded who we are. Those realities exist, and, I, and it's just a matter of doing the work. And, and many of those folks are looking for uh, sincere folks. They, they may have the time. I mean, the work that I do have, have allowed me to sit in front of um, black millionaires that I didn't seek out. They sought me out. I was allowed me to sit in front of uh, city council members to support it and just have a genuine relationship. Again, you understand their their uh, their social class, but it's your job to educate them now and your job to, to move them to come back and, and support. Not uh, not that term of give back, of support and do what they're supposed to. That's the obligation that we, that we have. But again, we have to create create a platform of, of a standard that's, that's, that is necessary. Cause, Cause that same person that you turn your back on may be that same person that you rock, was gonna rock. <laughs> I mean, that, that was, I mean, these are things that we have to begin to, to help educate. Cause even the most educated need to be educated. <laughs> and those who know me know I don't part with this. My daughter's uh, bus driver see me come out there one morning. And I had my pajamas on, but I had my hat on. <laughs> it's like. The next day, he said, do you wear it? Or when, because I meet them. I'm, I get to the school before the bus gets there uh, every day. And she said, do you wear your hat to bed? Um, I just, it's my security. But I'm going to take it off today because um, I got to do this. I got. I went to a power breakfast downtown at the Hyatt this morning. It was $45 a seat. Guy did a presentation about poverty, and I'm gonna be honest with you, man. Uh, it was whack. It was whack. I don't know how much they gave him, but it was too much. If he got anything for that presentation. You know, some of the local people that responded, a couple of those said a good thing. Um, but I'm sure he got some thousands. My brother been on the road for about three weeks. Been in New Baltimore, New York, North Carolina, back to Baltimore, stuck for two more days because of the weather down there and got here. And I want to pass this hat. If you can, you can. Um, but I'm going to pass the hat for this brother, man. Um, that's, that's, uh, he does a lot of free work. Um, if nothing else, he can get him an extra meal. Maybe he can go to Uncle Moe's or something, you know? So I'm gonna pass my hat, which I usually don't take off my head. <laughs> Inspiration when I come through to rock the nation. Demand our independence like an island full of Haitians. Hesitation, son, we patiently waiting, waiting. 
Like the death of Ronald Reagan Activists quit might strike rhymes Pump fist workshop all day No pay like this So Nate raise funds Survivors, victims Freedom, bell rung Banger system My heartbeat pumps streets To these blocks and tracks with speed Then I proceed to wreck shop